Garcia actually joined uh, joined me and helped organize a trade mission to India, uh, which I did when I was the uh, Minister of Economic Development in Ontario um, about uh, four years ago now. So um, I welcome the, uh, this organization, the Canada-India Business Council. It's very important to foster uh, good relationships, especially economic relationships, between India and Canada. So how important is the relationship between Canada and India? Well, it's very important, and uh, you know, I meet with the, uh, the Indian Minister of Finance uh, at international uh, conferences. India is, is uh, one of the great emerging economies in the world. Large population, English speaking, um, the world's largest democracy. Um, these are all positives, and of course, we have more than 700,000. Uh, people living in this country, the second largest group we have in, in, in Canada, new Canadians, and second generation now and third generation Canadians um, whose heritage is, is from India. So we have great business relationship potential with India. I, well, I see a very strong future in terms of economic relationships. We already have uh, uh, companies like Wipro and, and, and uh, other uh, Indian companies that have chosen to do business in Canada. We welcome that investment in Canada. Um, we think Canadian businesses need to do more business in India as well. And uh, that's something that we can encourage. The Minister of International Trade, Minister Emerson, my colleague, was in India last week. I was talking to him about his trip. He felt very, very strongly that we need to continue to enhance the relationship between India and Canada. Well, you know, they, uh, I, I, I was impressed when I was in India a few years ago, and Minister Emerson was last week, by the, the emphasis on post-secondary education, and technological education, and engineering education. Very strong emphasis in India on advanced education, and that, that's important. That's something that, that we're emulating here in Canada, that uh, in my budget this year we brought in measures to encourage more post-secondary education, more graduate education. And this is part of the, you know, the Indian uh, success story, quite frankly, that is valuing education and pursuing education, financials assessment, by accurate, uh, meaning um, if, if someone perhaps, perhaps in, uh, in uh, Delhi wants to emigrate to Canada, that we will um, make sure that we have their credentials accurately assessed uh, by our agency, our new agency in Canada, before they come to Canada so that they know if they're going to go to British Columbia, for example, that they will qualify as a, an engineer in British Columbia. The work is underway. It's funded in, in, uh, in my budget. And uh, the Minister of Immigration is working hard on this. And we're, going to, uh, we're establishing our credentials uh, agency. Uh, the whole purpose is to make it easier for highly qualified immigrants um, to come to Canada. And as soon as they come to Canada, uh, engage in their uh, in their profession or occupation. Would it hold true for doctors as well, or are you looking right now only at the engineering profession? We're looking at all all of the professions and, and the skilled trades as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Okay. Welcome to today's edition of South Asian Outlook on Web TV. Today we're live on location on April the 26th at the Hudson's Bay Arcadian Court, presented by the Canada India, India Business Council. It is an event organized by CIBC to present the Canadian Business Person of the Year at the Gala Award today.
Minister of India. That's what the partnership is all about. My heartfelt uh, thanks to you on behalf of the CNBC and the board. Uh, today we have the distinct pleasure of uh, hearing from the most, I don't know the word most, prominent Minister of the Canadian Government. Uh, the, the press says he's a potential Prime Minister, but we heard that. Also going to close the first thing for the government, and that's where the power is. The Minister of Finance, Honorable Jim Perry. We also have the pleasure and privilege hearing from the top business leader of Canada, Mr. Don Stewart, Don Stewart, of Sunlight Financial, who is in order to this speaker. And to add to our joy of this evening and a distinct honor and pleasure, we have His Excellency Mr. Narayan, the newly appointed arrived High Commissioner of India to Canada, and we are pleased that he came here uh, soon after he took over. Could you please stand up for a second? And and give a big round of applause. Mr. High Commissioner, this is a very poor country, but the people are very poor. And you'll see it as, a, as you spend your balance with the term here. A uh, couple of quick announcements, uh, because I'm not trying to explain here. Uh, first of all, the Canada Business Council has announced and repeats itself again. We've taken a mining mission to India in September. They have a response. We have uh, Dr. Arun Basu here, the, 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 uh, one of the executives of the committee, and Himan Shah, a board member of India, right now working on the mission. Uh, second, I wish to recognize a uh, very important issue here. Our corporate sponsor, and they are, and they are the uh, Bata, Bombardier. Deloitte and Bush, National Post of EDC, the law firm of Oscar Boston Harper, Board of Halifax, RDC Financial Group, Subchem, Scotia Bank, Sunlight Financial, TCS, ED Bank Financial Group, and the law firm of Curries. Uh, I'd like to also welcome our new board member, Tom Drucker. You know, stand up for a second, Tom. He is from the Bada Group, the general counsel.
first, the first time he got into trouble, he opened the, opened the first letter and said, uh, blame your predecessor, which he did. He said that worked quite well with the media in the United Kingdom. The second time he got into trouble, he uh, opened up the second letter and it said, blame statistics. And he said that worked quite well also with the media. And the third time he got into trouble, he opened the letter and it said, write three letters to your successor. <laughs> Let me say a bit tonight about, uh, about uh, Canada and India and our business uh, relationships, and, uh, family relationships, and, and uh, talk a bit also about uh, the Canadian economy and where we are and uh, where we're situated, our fiscal fundamentals in Canada and where we're going. I'll try not to go on, uh, try not to go on too long. But I know the main theme of, 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 of this dinner is partnerships, and as you know from experience, um, successful partnerships are founded on a strong mutual commitment to achieve a common goal. Successful partnerships are founded on the exchange of knowledge, the sharing of risk, and the ultimate uh, reward of uh, achievement. Comme vous le savez par l'expérience, un partenaire a de réussir les goals sur un ferme engagement mutuel à atteindre un objectif uh, commun. India and Canada have been developing uh, just such a partnership over, over the years. Um, we're working together to enrich people's lives, to strengthen our economies, to enhance our cultural diversity. India's contribution to Canada has been profound and deeply rewarding um, for Canada. Today, India is the second largest source of new Canadians with over 900,000 people of Indian heritage calling Canada home. Um, the Export Development Corporation people are here tonight. I've got another statistic which I like, that 50% of our exports to India are being financed by EDC, which is a, a good thing to know as well. The Indo-Canadian Indo community, as you know, has made an invaluable contribution to life here in the uh, Greater Toronto area and in communities right across Canada. And this uh, Canada-India Business Council has played a critical role in uh, moving this relationship forward. So for the last 25 years, your members have continually demonstrated strong leadership in promoting trade and investment, strategic partnerships, and collaboration between Canadian and Indian businesses. Your determination and forward-looking approach are inspiring. The people in this room have been instrumental in focusing attention on this emerging economic giant, which is uh, India. India, as you know, has one of the most competitive and fastest growing economies on the planet. It's currently the world's 12th largest economy and projected to be the fourth largest by 2025. India is increasingly being seen as a market of boundless opportunity and tremendous potential. While the world is turning its attention to India, we have only scratched the surface. Currently, India is Canada's 14th largest export market, while Canada is India's 24th largest export market, far below our trade potential here in, uh, in Canada. Our market share of India's exports and imports are a fraction of countries such as the United States or the EU or Australia. They are outrunning us in this highly competitive global economy, and the need to set the pace is, is important from a, uh, from a Canadian point of view. As a trading nation, and you know this Canadian nation grew wealthy on trade, on free trade. As a trading nation, Canada must pursue trade and investment opportunities in a systemic and sustained way. Canada's new government, our government recognizes that, and recognizes the vital role that uh, government plays in helping the partnership to flourish. So we must take steps to create an environment that encourages diversity and fosters excellence. We must reach out to help further open the doors for our entrepreneurs and, uh, and risk takers. India can benefit by uh, leveraging Canadian knowledge, skills, and expertise, especially in the areas of infrastructure, information and communications technology, the life sciences, mining and financial services and agriculture. And let's not forget that, that investment drives trade. 
2A investment is the essential catalyst for development of supply chain links. It's the key to the transfer of knowledge and technology that support innovation, which in turn enhances trade and competitiveness. If we want a stronger, more durable trade relationship, if we want to be a global leader in developing and adapting technology, if we want to drive Canada's productivity and competitiveness, then we must see more two-way investment. My cabinet colleague, David Emerson, uh, the Minister of International Trade, just returned from India, uh, where he was uh, last week, and tells me we are making progress. Just prior to David's visit, uh, Parliamentary Secretary uh, Ted Menzies, acting on behalf of Minister Emerson, was joined by CIBC's uh, Cam Ruffy and, and representatives from a number of infrastructure companies on what I'm told was a, a very successful trade mission to, uh, to Delhi and uh, Hyderabad and Mumbai. New business and contacts have already resulted from that mission, I'm told, added to the uh, recent surge of activity. So our government cares about this relationship, and that's why our ministers and parliamentary secretaries are taking the time and working with you in order to expand this uh, important uh, trading relationship. Over the past couple of years, we've seen investment into Canada by India in the order of a couple of billion dollars. Birla, India's third largest business group, is partnering with Sun Life Assurance of Toronto in a $100 million joint venture. A number of India's banks are now placing trails into Canada, including the State Bank of India, the Bank of India, the Punjab National Bank. These banks bring customers, their customers will bring more trade and more investment and more commercial links between our two economies. In order to broaden and deepen our relationship, Minister Emerson is working on a new global commerce strategy in which India will figure prominently. This global commerce strategy is about building global supply chains and building global value networks. And it features three core elements. Firstly, supporting an expansion of our bilateral trade agreement network. Secondly, strengthening our competition, our competitive position in the U.S. market. And finally, extending our reach in other key markets. We are completing an assessment of markets and opportunities among our many uh, trading partners where there are significant opportunities and a trading partner is willing to work expeditiously to remove barriers and forge links, we are ready to engage. I can assure you, India is at the top of our list. Minister Emerson is also finalizing a...
G7, G8, finance ministers meeting, G20, lots of Gs around the world, uh, IMF, World Bank meetings, and talk about our Canadian economy and the state of our government uh, finances. We have the strongest economic fundamentals in the G7 here in, here in Canada. Our economy is strong and it's getting stronger, making us an, an attractive uh, destination for investors, as you see day by day. Our economic fundamentals are rock solid. We are experiencing the second longest period of economic expansion in the history of Canada. The only longer period was the period immediately following the Second World War. Core inflation has remained within our set range of 1 to 3 percent. Our unemployment rate is the lowest it's been in 30 years. With more Canadians working, our labor force participation rate is the highest it's ever been in, in the history of Canada. We have a government debt burden that is the lowest in the G7. We're paying down debt at a record rate. We've only been in the government for 15 months or so. We've paid down $22 billion of debt. That's $700 for every man, woman, and child in Canada. We've moved the yardstick further and faster than, than I ever imagined we could when we started it in, uh, in February 2006. Canada is an emerging energy superpower in the world. We have the second largest reserves of oil in the world. Only Saudi Arabia has more. We're the third largest producer of natural gas in the world, the number one producer of uranium, the number one producer of hydroelectric power in the world, the cleanest source of power in the world, and more to come as we build a national energy grid across across Canada, the number one mineral mineral exploration uh, location in the world. This is all part of Canada as an emerging energy um, superpower. Now we're a superpower there. In Ottawa, we're actually a minority government. And, uh, <laughs> so I, uh, as enthused as I can get about the economy, the reality is, at least I'm able to leave Ottawa today because it's, uh, it's Thursday night and there were no votes, so I was allowed to leave anyway. Um, historically, minority governments have had limited success. I did take a little bit, a little bit of pride in our government. This, and that is, we are the first minority government in 40 years to bring in two budgets, both of which have passed in the House of Commons. The first, the first budget, Budget 2006, uh, contained tax reductions, more tax reductions in that budget than in the previous four uh, Liberal budgets combined. But tax reductions are more than, more than $20 billion. Um, and then that's the direction, of course, that, that we want to go. We believe that Canadians are, are overtaxed. The two budget implementation bills that, uh, that followed Budget 2006 both went through the House of Commons, were approved through the Liberal-dominated Senate, and were approved and received royal assent and are now the law of Canada. Every budget measure in Budget 2006 is now the law of Canada. The Ways and Means motion for Budget 2007 has already passed through the House. And now we're proceeding with the first uh, with the first budget bill. So this is something that at least uh, in, in a minority government to be able to drive our economic agenda for the country is vitally important. As I say, this hasn't happened in Canada since uh, Expo 67 40 years ago, the two budgets have come up. So what are we trying to do in our budgeting? Well, we're reducing taxes significantly for individuals and families and businesses. We are limiting the growth of spending on average to the rate of growth of nominal GDP. Over the course of the mandate, the rate of growth of spending should be about 4.1%. The rate of growth of the of nominal GDP should be about a percentage point higher than that. The books, of course, are balanced. We're running surpluses. We're paying down debt at a record level. And as today you heard the announcements, I'm sure you heard the the news that the Minister of the Environment, my friend and colleague John Baird, has announced <clears throat> that we are regulating um, greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution for the first time in Canadian, in Canadian history. We're also implementing our long-term economic plan for Canada, which we developed last year called Advantage Canada. And just a few words about the economic plan. Now you're in business and you know that you're going to plan ahead for your, for your business.
businesses, you need to have a plan. Well, believe it or not, the government of Canada didn't have one. So last year, we, we developed it, we developed one, we consulted. Why? I mean, we developed a plan called Advantage Canada, which is about giving Canada the advantages we need to compete today and into the future. A tax advantage, a fiscal advantage, an entrepreneurial advantage, a knowledge advantage, and uh, an infrastructure advantage. Just a few words about, about that. In a tax advantage, our goal is to establish the lowest tax rate on new business investment in the G7. We've only been in the government for 15 months. We've already moved from sixth to third as a result of the two budgets we've done. So right now we have the third lowest rate on new business investment in the G7. We're going to, of course, continue to reduce taxes for, for all Canadians. On the fiscal side, we are committed to eliminating Canada's total government net debt in less than a generation. Australia has achieved that. That is something we can achieve in Canada using the OECD measures. On the entrepreneurial side, we are going to reduce unnecessary regulation and red tape in order to increase competition in the Canadian marketplace and make it easier for small and medium-sized businesses to do business in Canada. We are committed to reducing the red tape from the Government of Canada by 20% by November 2008. We're a government that sets goals, we measure what we do. The Secretary of State responsible, Jerry Ritz from Saskatchewan, and I are working on this, and we will accomplish that 20% reduction with the help of others, Native Federation of Independent Business, and others by November 2008. On the knowledge side, this is vitally important for our future. I met today with some of our scientists in Ottawa, and some of the people responsible for our funding, our universities, our colleges, our research and innovation. India has shown this for many years, the emphasis on, on post-secondary education. Vitally important for the, for the future of our country and for our children and their children um, going forward. We're going to continue our investments, massive investments in this budget, budget 2007, in science and technology, skills training, universities and colleges and graduate studies, the creation of new scholarships, not only in science and engineering and the life sciences, but also in business. We don't have enough graduate students in Canada. We don't have enough people studying in the life sciences and engineering. We also don't have enough business students in Canada. So we're going to encourage that. We're going to welcome more graduate students from abroad, including India, of course, to Canada to study. We're offering more scholarships this is all part of the knowledge advantage in, in our long-term economic plan for Canada. And lastly, the infrastructure advantage, and this is vitally important. We have more than $30 billion now committed <laughs> to building the infrastructure we need in this country to grow, to grow the Canadian economy going forward. That will be levered with provincial money, with municipal money, with private sector money. This is a fund that is worth not less than, if that leverage, not less than $100 billion, which all Canadians are going to see spent over the course of the next five to 10 years. This is a dramatic commitment to rebuilding Canadian infrastructure, which, which has been neglected, including our West Coast Gap Gateway. And those of you who have studied these things know that our ports on the West Coast are two days or so, some will argue three days, closer to Asia, than our competitors on the, on the U.S. West Coast. But we have to have the proper transportation links in Western Canada in order to maximize the, the uh, advantage that we have in the Pacific uh, Gateway. So last fall, Prime Minister Harper announced $591 million for Canada's Asia-Pacific Gateway and Corridor Initiative. In the budget this year, we increased that to about uh, just uh, over $1 billion. The bulk of this funding will be used to make key infrastructure investments such as better roads and new road and rail grade um, separations. Um, let me say a word or two about immigration, immigration policy um, in, uh, in Canada. Um, just 10 days ago, the Bank of Canada's Spring Outlook Survey found that most Canadian businesses expect to hire more workers in the next 12 months to meet increased demand for their products and, and services. The problem we have is that labor shortages may hold back their ability to grow. 
41% of firms surveyed said they expect to face labor shortages in the next 12 months. This uh, shortage of skilled workers coupled with an aging population, Canada shares this challenge with, with many other uh, uh, industrialized countries, uh, coupled with the aging population is creating a national challenge for Canadians. Uh, to meet that challenge, Advantage Canada stresses the importance of welcoming more immigrants who are most likely to succeed in the Canadian economy. In our budget this year, uh, we made a commitment by putting in place measures to ensure that Canada's immigration policies are more closely aligned with the needs of the labour market. The budget also focuses on seeing to it that newcomers are able to find an employment that uses their talents and skills and experience more quickly. When well-qualified new immigrants from India and around the world arrive in Canada, they must have the support they need to begin a successful new life in this country. The need for more engineering and graduate students in Canada is profound, and India could easily help us fill that void. India's world-class uh, institutions and graduating are graduating hundreds of thousands of engineers and doctors and scientists and entrepreneurs uh, every year. In fact, India is now one of the world's most prolific producers of highly educated people. And there is no doubt um, that this will underpin India's growing prosperity and global competitiveness um, for decades to come. Quite simply, what we need to do um, to get away from some of the complex language is to make sure that when someone wants to immigrate to Canada from abroad, that, that the Canadian government facilitates uh, making sure that their qualifications match what they seek to do in Canada. And that involves some working with the provinces, of course, because most of the professional regulation in Canada is done by the, uh, by the provinces and, and the territories. So that matching should be done abroad. So that when the person arrives in Canada, the person can immediately engage in their profession or occupation. And that is precisely uh, our goal. This will contribute to our success here in Canada, of course, because we need more uh, highly skilled and, and professional people. We also have measures in the budget this year to permit foreign students with Canadian credentials and work experience and skilled temporary foreign workers who are already in Canada to apply for permanent residence without leaving Canada. In addition, the government will facilitate the assessment and recognition of credentials through the creation of the Foreign Credential Referral Office, which will perform the function that I just described to you. Um, that office will provide the prospective immigrants overseas and those already in Canada with the information they need in order to match their, their credentials with what's, with what's available. Now, I've gone on almost as long as it seems, I know. Um, I will uh, come, to a, uh, come to a conclusion. It's great to be here with you. My relationship with this organization is, a, is a one of which I am fond. I know you do great work in, in facilitating uh, economic relations between India and, uh, and Canada. So let me leave you with a few uh, final thoughts, if I may. Um, you know, we have a tremendous opportunity uh, before us. And we must seize that, uh, that opportunity. India and Canada have common interests, common goals, and the ability and the focus and the commitment to achieve uh, those goals. This begins by, by recognizing that India is an emerging economic power whose reach and influence uh, continues to expand around the globe. It is an economic force that has resources and innovative technology, skilled labor, and uh, greater access to global markets. Canada, on the other hand, as I've said this evening, is an emerging energy superpower. Canada is a center of excellence in science and technology. Canada has a highly educated and skilled workforce and is a natural gateway to the largest market in the world, next door to us. The mutual benefits are obvious for India and Canada, and the need to forge a stronger economic partnership is essential. So Canada's new government is determined to ensure we do what we can to further our relationship with uh, India. Our government, along with the private sector, is focusing on India like never before. It's good for families and businesses in, in both countries. I know that over the years, the Canada-India Business Council has provided outstanding support for achieving 
um, to that common goal that we share. Again, I applaud you for your uh, efforts and look forward to working with you as we continue moving toward more prosperous economies in both countries and a more sustainable and secure um, global economy. Thank you for inviting me to with you this evening.
This is a very fast-paced world, expanding free trade zones and proliferation of bilateral trade deals. Competition among countries is as fierce as competition among businesses. So make no mistake, it is our flag versus their flag. Their flag versus our maple leaf. Canada needs to promote an even stronger national brand in India. And from our point of view, the race is already on. Canada needs to compete and compete to win. It is indeed time to show the world, and India especially, that we need business. From my perspective, as a company with a significant history in India, I would offer some thoughts and support of what was said earlier. I would encourage the engagement of Indian decision makers deliberately, continuously, and strategically. Government to government is a critical place to found our efforts. I would say that the highest level engagement is critical. Building a relationship at the top sets the right tone of commitment and partnership. The Government of Ontario, as we've heard, and the Federal International Trade Ministry have completed trade missions to India recently. Sunlight has been an active participant in these initiatives and they have our firm support. But if Canada is to continue punching above its weight on the global stage, there needs to be an ongoing higher level of strategic purpose and execution. We need to coordinate and deepen the pan-Canadian approach to leverage these opportunities. We should intensify the number of diplomatic, trade and cultural initiatives across federal and provincial governments. We need to pursue, as the Minister has outlined, a clear and common strategy each mission, each initiative, and each cultural exchange building off the previous one. We should also focus on Canada's core competencies, the sectors where we can win against the best the world has to offer. As has been noted, and it won't surprise you, that I say very clearly, we have world-class financial services expertise in Canada. We need to promote this expertise in India and seek greater investment liberalization in this sector. Other value-added industries such as technology have been noted. And in global negotiations, our government must be prepared to purposefully support its international champions. We need to pursue, as the Minister noted, the bilateral trade agreement with India to improve access to all key economic sectors and to grow our trade over the next decade. The Minister's colleague, the Canadian Trade Minister's Parliamentary Secretary, has already publicly explored the benefits of such an arrangement. I would sum it up by saying, as India becomes a dominant world player, Canada will meet India India will be Canada. In business, as indeed in life, relationships require ongoing effort and investment. Sun Life is investing considerable efforts in India, and this has proven to be a tremendous choice for us. And we believe this is the right choice for Canada. Thank you all very much indeed for the opportunity. Throw a bowl of soup. I wouldn't do that. It never makes the word. See what happens is the second one. The first time you have a
and I can testify to that how difficult it is to do business uh, in foreign land, even though India is a member of land. And uh, I was for five years uh, responsible to analyze for aid to India uh, before they got taken over and I had to leave them. Yeah. I became jobless. Uh, it was better for me to uh, advocate and I got into the CIBC here and I'm joining it. Anyway, uh, I'm sure you want to move along and come to the punchline here. Uh, the person who will be presenting this award is because of hard work, dedication, leadership, uh, compassion, uh, patience, uh, which we need uh, a lot in uh, being overseas. And this person, which I'm going to reveal in a second, was was named by the former High Commissioner Samuel Kausik as the court poster boy at court for the Canada Canadian Business Relations. And ladies and gentlemen, in one second, I want to go and get the award and then announce the winner is. <laughs> in honor and my privilege to announce the first business person of the year award goes to none other than somebody we all like, an excellent person, friend, mentor, and guide, Mr. Gary Kamafar. Because very few individuals are given an opportunity, such as I was, to represent a great company in reestablishing themselves in a great company, in a great country. Uh, it took me several trips to understand India, and I'm not sure that I completely understand India 100% today. But I have certainly grown to love and respect India. The people, the country, the customs. Um, just everyday life, which is very, very, very different and very, very uh, uh, unique in the multiculturalism in many respects that, are, that exists in India today that also exists in Canada. You know, as business people, we often look and say, what are our priority markets and what should we be really concentrating on? And of course today, both India and China are, are countries that are their foremost on kind of the economic horizon. But it's really through, you know, kind of the efforts of our government, the minister. I think that Canada can be very well represented as we go forward. Canada is an excellent brand. Uh, Canada is a great country to be representing. And the welcome that Canadians receive in India each and every day that, that we uh, operate there is tremendous. And I, I guess in conclusion would want to sincerely thank everyone uh, for this honor, but more importantly, to look at India, uh, to look at the warmth of India, to look at the generosity of India, to look at the business opportunities. If I can end with a story. After, uh, after oh, almost nine years of traveling to India, I thought it was time that I take my son there. So I say to, uh, so I asked my son Patrick, who was here this evening, and I said, Patrick, how would you like to go visit India? And he says, uh, gee, Dad, I'd really like that. So I said, well, I think that I would really, really like to go to India with you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we travel off, and of course I had a few business meetings, as normal. And Patrick got to see the, many of the, the, the cultural aspects and the, and the great country of India. And kind of at the end of the journey, we go up to Shimla. And we go up to the, uh, to the Himalayas, and we do some whitewater rafting up there. A great experience. And then we get on a small gauge railway for our way home. And as we come through, and we're probably 50 miles out of Chandigarh, the railway kind of stops and, you know, it's kind of an Indian fashion, it just kind of ends. <laughs> and Patrick is sitting at the window, and he's looking out the window and he says, Dad, he says, do you have a branch here? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I said, maybe. And he says, well, there's two gentlemen standing there with suits on and flowers. <laughs> and he says, I think they're for you. 
<laughs> and you know what? They were. <laughs> they were our Sun Life managers in that small town. And they, the generosity of, of their spirit, the generosity of the country, I think was best exemplified by the fact that we were greeted in what we would refer to as the middle of nowhere with a great deal of warmth and a great deal of affection. And that's the way I feel about India. And I in India to think of that because it's a great country to do business in and I hope that I'm associated for many years with promoting Canada-India business relations. Thank you very much for this talk. Music to any high commitment yes. And I think uh, our way is such a wonderful start. Uh, we will go forward with uh, Canada. The opportunities are Boundless, limitless, and uh, there are uh, many, many synergies uh, as we look at the future between India and Canada. They are both high growth economies, they are both economies, open economies, they are both democracies, and I think they are economies where there is political will to, to get to know each other better and to do business, and of course. Uh, the Indo-Canadian community, which has been in this country for over a century, which uh, represents the vibrancy of multicultural Canada. Uh, I think this would be a great asset to India and to Canada. And I think uh, our Canada speeches should be kept short. So I have very great pleasure in, uh, uh, in, in, in congratulating uh, the recipient of this award and in celebrating his, his spirit in which uh, Birla Sun Life has approached India. All the very best to you in the future. Thank you.